Okay, I think we'll begin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending in today in what is our second of eight in our EHS educational webinars. And today's topic is top health and safety compliance uh, challenges. And essentially what this is today, this is uh, some lessons learned, what we have learned through the years in performing uh, health and safety compliance audits at a variety of facilities. Uh, so our format today, I do have some uh, a series of PowerPoint slides that I'm going to show you. And at the end, I'll leave time to answer questions as well. And if you do have a question, please use the Q&A function, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Just type your question and we'll go through those questions at the end. And if we run out of time and not are not able to answer all the questions, we will, uh, I'll send out a written reply to any unanswered questions uh, at a later time. Uh, everybody that's uh, on this uh, participating today will also receive a certificate of attendance. Uh, you should get that within the next few days or so. We are emailing those individually to, to each of you. So uh, let's begin. I am going to share my screen. And as the, uh, the title of the presentation indicates, this is a R, R, NSAFE's top 12 list. And this, what you're looking at here, this slide, are our top 12 major topics that we identify as health and safety compliance challenges in the audits that we've uh, performed. And the way that this uh, presentation is going to work today is we're going to talk about each of these. It's not, we're not going to go into great detail on every single one of these items, but we are going to hit on a few highlights on, on each of these. Everybody on this call uh, should have received an email from me approximately 30 minutes ago with this document. It's a four-page document, and it lists our most frequent health and safety compliance challenges. So again, what this is, this is a list of those items that we tend to see over and over and over again as we do health and safety audits at a variety of sites. Now, please understand what this document is not. It's not a full compliance assessment tool. So not every element, for example, of walking working surfaces is listed here or of exit routes or flammable liquids. Instead, what you do, what, what these items represent, these subtopics, these are some of the most frequently uh, cited challenges that we see when we visit uh, sites here. And so I, as we put this document together, I consulted with several of our senior health and safety auditors uh, at NSAFE uh, to come up with this list. And ultimately what you're looking at is the uh, results of literally hundreds, perhaps uh, thousands of audits that have been performed uh, over uh, many years. So uh, under each topic, there are several subtopics. And again, we'll, uh, I will comment on some of these as we go through the, uh, the presentation. So our first topic today is uh, on our top 12 list is walking working surfaces. And on the handout that I emailed to you, you'll see these nine items uh, listed. And with regards to walking working surfaces, the subtopics include the number one, the very basic keeping walking working surfaces in clean, orderly, and sanitary condition and free of slip, trip, and uh, fall hazards. There are also issues here regarding uh, ladders and fall hazards as well. So with regards to uh, slip, trip, fall hazards, and uh, keeping walking, working surfaces uh, clean and orderly and sanitary, a lot of this is common sense uh, information here. So it's obvious that there's a cord blocking the path on those uh, stairs there, and you have an unprotected uh, opening in that picture there in the center of the slide. However, uh, one thing I do want to share with you that I thought might be a, a, of interest to you all is uh, a, an approach, a methodology for how you prior might prioritize fall hazards in your facility. 
And as uh, EHS professionals, we're probably, most of you are probably familiar with this methodology, this common methodology that we use to assess hazards, that is identify the hazards and prioritize for control by assessing se potential severity and likelihood uh, of an event. Well, this same methodology can also be applied to fall hazards as well. And so what I'm sharing with you here is an example occupational fall hazard risk matrix. This is a tool that, that I've used at some sites to help prioritize uh, fall hazards. Because in a large facility, you may have many uh, fall hazards and it may not be practical to try to correct every one of them uh, immediately. Uh, and what this table does, on the left there, we list a, a number of risk factors from zero to two or more. And at the, across the top there, we have the frequency, that is how frequent someone is exposed to that particular fall hazard. And that, and that ranges from multiple occurrences per month all the way to less than uh, once per year. The, the risk factors, there are three primary risk factors that you might use for this uh, methodology. One is walking or working within uh, six feet of a leading edge. Uh, hazardous work surface, such as a frozen precipitation, an incline, or some sort of slip, trip, or fall hazard, or the person is doing active work, pushing, pulling, stretching, reaching, or climbing, for example. So you match, you match those uh, risk factors with the frequency of occurrence, and then you get some sort of a relative severity of that fall hazard from low to high. And this tool could help you to prioritize which fall hazards you may want to uh, uh, invest capital uh, funding to, uh, to correct uh, immediately. Our next topic is exit routes, number two on our list here. And one thing interesting about this topic, number 10, is it says compliance with the 2009 NFPA 101 Life Safety Code or the 2009 International Fire Code is an acceptable alternative. And I will add that every item that is listed on that most frequently cited challenges, all 79 of them, comes directly from either an OSHA or an NFPA standard. It's direct, it comes directly from one of those two standards. And OSHA in their exit routes uh, standard specifically says that as an alternative, you can comply with the Life Safety Code or the International Fire Code. And I can tell you, however, that the provisions for exit routes in the Life Safety Code or the International Fire Code are much more detailed than what you're going to find in the OSHA standard. Nevertheless, uh, other items that you see here are issues related to uh, exit access being free, unobstructed, the width of exit access, safeguards in your building, such as uh, sprinkler systems, fire alarm systems, and others, uh, exit signs, and also emergency action, action plans. So let's, uh, let's talk about a couple of these. And the first one I want to discuss is emergency action plans. So uh, oftentimes, uh, they may, uh, an insight may not have a plan or it may not have all the elements that's required to be in the emergency action plan. Uh, one thing I want to share with you, OSHA actually has a pretty slick tool on their website for determining whether or not you need a site needs an emergency action plan. And there's a series of yes, no questions that you uh, answer. And at the end of answering those questions, it's going to tell you whether or not you need, uh, whether or not you need an emergency action plan. Next under uh, egress or uh, exit routes is maintaining egress paths uh, clear and unobstructed. unobstructed. And this is a, another common sense item here. Here's a classic example uh, in the back of a theater uh, actually, but it's, it is something that we see uh, quite uh, regularly. And as far as exit routes, there are uh, several case studies in the literature uh, that describe where uh, poor exit routing or blocked exit routes were uh, contributed to a significant loss in life. And one classic example of that is a chicken plant fire that occurred in North Carolina in 1991. And perhaps uh, some of you may recall this particular incident. So at this plant, uh, the, the employees uh, cut, process, and cook chicken for distribution to uh, uh, restaurants. And a fire breaks out in the central processing area, which is indicated in the photo on the right there. 
I had, this is a floor plan of this particular chicken plant, and I want you to uh, uh, notice the way that the plant is laid out. There's not, uh, it, it, there's not uh, designated uh, corridors. It's a poor strategy for life safety or uh, occupant uh, egress there. The fire origin starts in the center of the plant there, the processing area. A number of doors were actually locked on the perimeter that which prohibited people from being able to get out in a timely manner. Some sections of the plant were actually uh, determined, uh, uh, people thought that they were uh, corridors leading to exits and they ended up being dead end uh, corridors there. Uh, you can see the photo at the right, that was a break room door that actually, and you can actually see the footprints on the door. The door had to be uh, kicked down, uh, kicked open in order for the occupants uh, to escape. So of the 90 people that were actually at this plant at the time, uh, 25 were killed and 54 were, were injured. So only a few people escaped this fire uh, uninjured. Uh, and uh, so contributing factors in this particular uh, fire to the large loss of life and number of injuries, no fire suppression system, no fire alarm system, locked exit doors, improper exit design, poorly marked exits, lack of fire safety training, and in inadequate building compartmentation. These are all features of exit routes that are addressed in some degree in OSHA standards or they will also be in the life safety code or the international fire code. OSHA did investigate this fire and issued uh, 83 violations uh, to the owners of the facility. What you're looking at here is just a typical corridor. It could be in an office building, uh, a hospital, or some sort of other uh, administrative uh, type building. And it looks quite simple and quite plain. But I can tell you from an exit route and a life safety strategy, it, there, it's a, actually a very complex system of what's going on here. There are a number of life safety features uh, evident in this particular photograph right here uh, that impact uh, would impact a person's or an occupant's ability to get out of the building in the event of emergency. So uh, some of those uh, life safety and exit route issues include what I have on these couple of uh, these next couple of slides. The lighting of the space, emergency lighting, the width of the corridor, how the corridors are constructed, are there fire barriers that are separating hazardous areas from the rest of the uh, uh, facility? Uh, the finishes, that is the, how the floor tile, ceiling tile, paints are uh, constructed, the types of materials that are used for that. In that particular photograph, it was a ceiling designed to limit the passage of smoke. How the doors are constructed, positive latching for the doors, the undercut at the bottom edges of the doors. Are there smoke barriers and smoke barrier doors that are subdividing the space in the smoke compartments? Fire extinguishers, sprinkler systems, fire alarm systems, smoke detection, exit signage, uh, building communication, and uh, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning issues. All of these issues are addressed or in the life safety code or to some degree in uh, the OSHA standard, but not nearly in the level of detail that you would see in the, in the life safety code. So again, coming back to this uh, photograph right here, it looks very simple but from a life safety and exit route uh, standpoint, it's actually a very complex system of safeguards. Now let's look at industrial sites here. Uh, and you, one question that we often get is, are our uh, egress routes in our industrial site actually wide enough? We've got some, a client might tell us that they've got some sites that are particularly uh, uh, narrow. Uh, by the way, there is no requirement in OSHA or NFPA that you paint your walkways, but that might be a best practice if you're trying to manage uh, pedestrian traffic and particularly if you have locations where fork trucks and pedestrians are uh, mixing in common areas. So it could help manage those, uh, those intersections and that traffic there. There are some uh, minimum, uh, some code minimums regarding Egress, egress width. And OSHA says uh, egress path must be at least 28 inches wide. And that's also in the life safety code NFPA 101 for existing buildings, uh, aisles and corridors must be at least 28 inches wide. But there's some exceptions to that as well. 
think about your offices or uh, cubicle uh, farms. You might have spaces, uh, aisles that are much narrower than that. So uh, in the life safety code, it says the, the clear width around furniture and movable partitions and similar features only needs to be 80, 18 inches wide at a height below 38 inches and at least 28 inches wide at a height above 38 inches. Also, think about your industrial equipment at your sites. You've probably got some walkways, uh, doors, stairs that are even narrower than, than some of that. Well, the, the minimum width for any kind of pathway uh, that's used for industrial equipment access is 22 inches clear width if the occupant load is less than or equal to 20 people. And that is a provision that comes from the life safety code. It's not in uh, specifically mentioned in OSHA, in, OSHA, in the OSHA standards, but recall that OSHA says that if you're uh, in compliance with the 2009 uh, life safety code, they, they deem you to be in compliance with the OSHA exit route standards there. Next issue is exits, that is particularly exit signage. So think about some of the locations in your facility and could you find an exit uh, if you needed to in an emergency? And the basic requirement, which comes from both uh, OSHA and NFPA is that first statement up there, an exit sign with a directional indicator shall be placed at every location where the direction of travel to reach the nearest exit is not apparent. It does not say that you must be able to see two exit signs or two exits at all time. It says, again, where the direction of travel to reach the nearest exit is not apparent, an exit sign with a directional indicator shall be placed in that particular location. Fire doors. So in your building, potentially you have dozens or even hundreds of fire doors. And I have been in buildings that literally have several hundred fire doors. And there are NFPA standards, uh, and then NFPA 80 is the standard that specifically addresses uh, fire doors. And there are provisions for uh, each fire door that must be met, such as the items that you see listed on this screen right here. Doors must be uh, self-closing, uh, they must have the fire the correct fire protection rating. Generally, they must swing with the direction of egress. There's some exceptions to that. No deadbolts or locks, uh, positive latching hardware, or limited in the, uh, the height of the undercut at the bottom of the door, plus other items as well. So these are just 11 separate provisions for fire doors. Now multiply, multiply that potentially by the dozens or hundreds of fire doors that you might have in your facility, and you could see it could be a, uh, a daunting task just to maintain fire doors in your facilities. Our next topic of our top 12 is flammable liquids. And this one has more subtopics on it than any of the others, uh, 14 here. And to be honest with you, it's, we just see, often see a lot of issues with how flammable liquids are handled and managed at, at sites. And the issues that you see listed on this screen here have to do, uh, deal with uh, signage on storage tanks and the uh, entrances to bu buildings, uh, filling of tanks and drums and the bonding and grounding issues associated with that, hazardous classified uh, locations, what to, how flammable liquid storage rooms are designed, uh, combustible waste materials, uh, exhaust systems uh, serving uh, flammable liquid processes, and much more. So let's talk about a few of these uh, issues here. So this, that first item is NFPA 704 hazard rating signage. I suspect that everybody's familiar with the NFPA diamond here, and this is a requirement that comes from the fire code. It's in the International Fire Code and it's also in NFPA standards. And those documents say that uh, NFPA 704 hazard rating signage shall be placed at stationary containers, above ground storage tanks, and entrances to areas with hazardous materials. The next topic here I'd like to discuss briefly is hazardous classified locations. And what you're looking at here is a example of a drawing depicting hazardous classified locations in a chemical processing facility. There is no requirement that you develop a drawing such as uh, this to indicate your hazardous classified locations, but this could be a best practice and could help 
you explain to others where your hazardous classified locations are. And I want to point out a few features of this particular drawing to help explain this uh, concept. So uh, note number one here, classifications are based on NFPA standard 497, which applies to flammable liquids, gases, or vapors. There's a sister standard for this, NFPA standard 499, which addresses combustible dust. All the provisions in 497 are also in NFPA 70, the National Electrical Code. And when you designate hazardous classified locations uh, for involving flammable liquids, uh, vapors, and gases, typically uh, you're going to ha have one of three designations, unclassified, class one, division one, or class one, division two. And this drawing depicts which uh, sections of, the, uh, of this particular process are class one, division one, and which ones are class one, division two here. So zooming in into our drawing here, you can see we have nine mixing tanks uh, located in this particular processing area. And there's a bubble around each mixing tank that's designated as class one, division one. And then there's larger bubbles beyond that that are designated as class one, division two. And all of that implies that the electrical equipment within these zones has to be uh, designed and suitable for these hazardous classified locations. This concept of designating spaces as uh, classified, hazardous classified location also applies to tanker truck loading and unloading areas, as well as to uh, uh, storage tank farms and other spaces uh, as well. Bonding and grounding is also an issue that we see uh, quite frequently with regards to flam particularly flammable liquid processes. As these liquids are, uh, tran are transferred, flowed, moved, they generate static uh, electricity. So there are static hazards associated with processing of flammable liquids. And the, as these liquids move or splash or, or, or whatnot, they can generate static uh, discharges that if they find a vapor cloud can cause a fire or an explosion. And what you're looking at in this uh, simple diagram right here is the drum is being used to dispense a flammable liquid into an open pail. And notice that the pail is bonded to the drum and the drum is bonded to the building's static grounding bus. The picture at the right is a bonding clamp, a pretty typical uh, bonding clamp uh, that you would use for attaching to a, uh, a metal surface. There are several or numerous uh, case studies in the literature where uh, static hazards created uh, fires, explosions, uh, and in, in some cases, uh, fatalities. One famous case involves a uh, chemical plant uh, in the Midwest that was investigated, an incident was investigated by the US Chemical Safety Board a number of years ago. And in this particular process, some totes, metal totes, were being filled with uh, ethyl acetate, but the uh, fill nozzle wasn't properly bonded to the tote. Hence, a spark was generated uh, near the fill nozzle, ignited the vapor cloud around the tote, causing a fire and explosion uh, in the plant. Uh, this is just, again, one example. There are many others uh, out there in the, uh, in the literature as well. We also mentioned that uh, flammable liquid storage rooms may not be designed properly. Uh, so there are a number of issues with how these rooms should be uh, designed, uh, including uh, the fire protection rating of the, uh, the walls, of the barriers of the room. There are ventilation issues. And notice in this particular flammable liquid storage room, the exhaust ventilation on the far wall there, the exhaust louver is actually located within 12 inches of the floor which is a requirement for a flammable liquid storage room. And the, obviously the purpose of that is most flammable vapors are heavier than air and hence will settle close to the, uh, the ground. So having uh, uh, exhaust close to the ground uh, helps uh, capture those uh, vapors that may be released, uh, potentially released in the room. And lastly, uh, from a, a flammable liquid stand, standing point, I want to talk about the uh, disposable of combustible waste materials. So this is a metal can. 
uh, and it's hard to read, but there's a sign on the uh, bottom of the can that says that it should be emptied every night. And that's actually a requirement in the fire code that when we dispose of, say, oil-laden uh, rags or solvent-laden rags, they be placed in covered metal receptacles that are, in fact, emptied on a daily basis. Next on our top 12 list is personal protective equipment. Uh, and there are issues here with regarding, regarding how we uh, maintain and store PPE, workplace hazard assessments, training, and what to do with defective PPE. Um, this second item right here, workplace uh, hazard assessments, is a, a fairly uh, important concept and it's something that uh, we find that is often missed at sites, uh, which I'll get to in just a moment. But what you're looking at here is a photograph of a fall protection harness that I found at a site. Uh, I found it in exactly this condition. It looks quite uh, dirty and obviously it's not being maintained in a clean and orderly uh, fashion there. And I also question the uh, function of the buckles that, that have developed a considerable amount of rust uh, on them. So this is not a, obviously a fall protection harness that I want to use uh, to, for protection from a fall hazard. And this idea of a, uh, performing hazard assessments for employees that are required to wear personal protective equipment. And what, what you're looking at here is an example of a simple PPE hazard assessment. And notice the statement near the, uh, the middle there uh, in bold that says, this document serves as a certification of hazard assessment. That is an OSHA requirement that if you have employees that are wearing personal protective equipment, that you document a hazard assessment and that that hazard, documented hazard assessment be, quote, certified uh, that it serves as a hazard assessment. And in this very simple tool that you're looking at here, we, uh, we identify what the hazards are, is PPE required, and then what is the appropriate PPE for that, that hazard. Next on our list is respiratory protection. Uh, on, on our list here, we've got issues re regarding your written respirator program, medical uh, approval for those required to wear respirators, uh, fit testing, what to do with respirators used in emergency situations, training, cartridge canister change schedules, and also evaluation, periodic evaluations to determine uh, program effectiveness. And this last item that is one that is uh, uh, quite often missed. Uh, it's a, people don't realize that the OSHA standard on respiratory protection requires you to, quote, evaluate your program periodically to determine its uh, effectiveness. I also want to hit on a couple of other issues. Uh, so in the picture at the right, that's a respirator that I'm not quite sure is being stored in an uh, uh, orderly and sanitary uh, manner. Uh, there also has to be uh, issues associated with cartridge change schedules, and that needs to be incorporated into your written respirator uh, program. In the picture at the right, this is an SCBA mounted, and this particular SCBA is mounted at the entrance to a refrigerant room. And that's something that I often see, uh, and that is a requirement that was in the building codes, uh, me specifically mechanical codes, uh, a number of years ago that SCBA, self-contained breathing apparatuses, be placed outside of refrigerant rooms. So the idea being that if there were some release of a refrigerant in the room, there would be an SCBA uh, available so the mechanic could go in the room with an SCBA and address the, uh, the leak there. Well, the people that wrote the building code didn't necessarily uh, consult with the health and safety professionals, I suspect, because having people wear uh, an SCBA in a, in a potentially immediately dangerous to life and health uh, atmosphere poses a lot of uh, compliance issues. So if a, you do have uh, respirators such as this that have to be used in an emergency situation, they have to be inspected uh, monthly as a minimum. Next on our list, lockout tagout. Uh, issues here include uh, having equipment specific energy control procedures, uh, lockout, tagout devices, periodic inspections of your energy control procedures, and training for those authorized and, for authorized and affected employees. Authorized employees are those authorized to work on live or energized electrical parts there. It, uh, let's talk about the first one. Equipment-specific energy control procedures are doc documented. The expectation is that you have a written document for 
uh, all pieces of equipment in your facility on how someone could uh, isolate and control the hazardous energy associated with that piece of equipment. Number 42 on the list deals with lockout and tag out devices. Singularly identified, not used for other purposes, they identify the employee applying the device and they're durable and standardized. So take a look at this picture right here. And a, a couple of potential issues here. I see the two master locks, and no, unless those locks have some sort of a unique serial number or identifier on them, potentially they may not be uniquely identifiable and may not be able to be tied back to an employee. Now, perhaps the intention was that the tag was going to be used to identify that who the employee was and lock that out, but you, the tag is obviously uh, illegible there. So potentially a number of issues with how these uh, devices are being used for lockout uh, purposes. Next on our list is uh, fire protection. And this deals with issues related to fire extinguishers, sprinkler protection, fire alarm systems, and uh, hot work hazards uh, as well. And uh, I've got a couple of case studies involving issues regarding fire protection systems. And one uh, classic example of that is the fire involving uh, one Meridia Plaza in Philadelphia in 1991. And you can see that it was a, a devastating uh, fire, it actually caused a hundred, over a hundred million dollars in damage in this particular fire. And ironically, the fire uh, was supposedly started uh, because a contractor left some oil soaked rags uh, in some section of the building and did not dispose of them in a proper manner. And the fire gradually spread, spreads uh, up uh, uh, through the building th to upper floors. And in, in this particular uh, case here, there were uh, a lot of features of fire protection that actually did not work properly, which contributed to the, uh, the spread of the fire in the building there. So it's a case study. If you don't maintain fire protection systems, potentially what could go wrong? One of the items we had on our list was fire extinguishers. So uh, the general requirement for placement of fire extinguishers for class A hazards, that is for ordinary combustibles, ordinary combustibles, is that the fire extinguisher must be within 75 feet of those class A hazards, as is depicted in this uh, simple diagram right here. However, if you have class B hazards, such as flammable liquids, uh, the travel distance requirements actually change, and the codes uh, state that uh, the distance between fire extinguishers suitable for class B hazards and the class B hazards must be less than or equal to 30 or 50 feet, depending on the rating of the fire extinguisher. Uh, other issues uh, that we've seen with fire extinguishers is uh, uh, one, are they readily uh, accessible or can employees actually, do employees actually know where the fire extinguishers are? And if you look in the photograph in the center there, you can see that this particular site, they elected to paint the columns red to indicate where the fire extinguisher might be located. Fire extinguishers also are to be inspected monthly and receive an annual maintenance check. And the tag that is uh, often attached to the fire extinguisher, in, such as the one in the top right corner, is often used to indicate the, those purposes. This, that particular tag happens to not be in very good condition. Uh, the, the fire extinguisher at the left is uh, quite interesting. I can't imagine uh, having to, someone having to access that fire extinguisher when that wasp nest was actually uh, uh, fully occupied. That would have been quite a surprise. Regarding sprinkler protection, uh, one common item that we see is that the, the, the code requires, specifically NFPA 13 requires that 18 inches of clearance be maintained below any sprinkler head. And that's the basic requirement. There are some uh, exceptions to that, but generally you have to maintain 18 inches clearance below a sprinkler head. That means you can't store items or put shelving within that 18 inches, uh, 18 inch space uh, underneath a, a sprinkler head. And the reason for that is, as you can see, uh, one sprinkler head actually has a wide uh, range of distribution here and by keeping that 18 inches clear, it allows a full development of this uh, distribution pattern. 
inspection, testing of fire alarm and fire suppression systems can is actually can be quite a complex uh, topic, and there's a lot uh, uh, to be done if you're going to actually do it uh, correctly. And what you're looking at here, these are just a few excerpts that I pulled out of NFPA 72, the National Fire Alarm Code, addressing some components of fire alarm systems, heat detectors, fire alarm boxes or pull stations, smoke detectors, and audible and visual, visible alarm notification devices. Inspected every six months and tested on an annual basis. And that's just, that's just these four items. And there are many other elements of a fire alarm system that also need inspection and testing as well. Regarding water-based fire protection or suppression systems, uh, sprinklers uh, are actually to be inspected on an annual basis and tested periodically de depending on the type of sprinkler head that you have. And yes, you can test sprinkler heads and the, uh, the uh, NFPA standards tell you how you might go about doing that. If you have a standpipe system, it needs to receive a flow test every five years. Fire pumps at your site should be inspected weekly and tested weekly under no flow conditions. Fire pumps should receive a flow test on an annual basis. If you have fire department connections, it should be inspected on a quarterly basis. Again, this is just a simplistic uh, view of some of the key components of a water-based fire protection system. There are many other provisions of it, but all and those are addressed in uh, the NFPA standards. And lastly, under fire protection, I'll leave you with one more case study. This is the Park Central uh, East Tower in Croc, Venezuela. Fire breaks out in uh, October of 2004. Fire starts in the 30th floor and works its way up, causing $250 million worth of damage. And the reason that the fire spread uh, so uh, prevalently throughout the, the building was that, that the sprinkler system was not maintained properly. When NFPA investigated this fire, they interviewed the maintenance personnel, and the maintenance personnel of the building said, yeah, we had some problems with the sprinkler system. We installed a series of valves to uh, minimize leaks that were occurring in the sprinkler system. And ultimately what they did is they choked the sprinkler system and standpipe systems of water so that they were not available uh, for fire protection uh, purposes. Hence the fire was allowed to spread to all floors uh, above the floor of origin. Our next topic is powered industrial trucks. We have issues here uh, listed regarding uh, the use of trucks in hazardous classified locations, there are uh, issues with battery charging areas, wheel chocks are placed under trucks, uh, trailers as they're being uh, uh, emptied or uh, filled, training for PIT operators and how we operate PITs in, in a safe uh, manner as well. So regarding that uh, topic of hazardous classified locations, uh, both OSHA and NFPA uh, address this and if you have powered industrial trucks that are entering locations that are designated as hazardous classified locations, then only those trucks that, have, that are suitable for those locations can be used in such environments there. So this is why going back to our flammable liquid discussion uh, earlier, having, you could see we're having a diagram showing where your hazardous classified locations were could be helpful in designing paths or, uh, for where your powered industrial trucks uh, may uh, go within your facility. Next on our list here is machine guarding. Now there are many OSHA specific, equipment specific standards regarding machine guarding. I only have two items listed here, but if you look at those equipment specific machine guarding standards in OSHA, ultimately they're all designed around this item number 62 here. Machine guarding is provided to protect the operator and other employees in the machine area from hazards such as those created by point of operation, ingoing nip points, rotating parts, flying chips, and sparks. Sparks. That's the basic requirement with how you should approach machine guarding. So one location where we often see machine guarding issues are in maintenance shops. Uh, for example, you see unguarded band saws and drill presses in this uh, uh, photo here. And let's talk about a, a drill press as one example here. So in the photo at the left, the drill press is uh, unguarded. However, look at the uh, photo at the right. You can see the shield uh, uh, placed in front of the, the chuck there. 
the operator would place his or her right hand on the lever and his or her left hand on the button on the left to operate the drill press. Hence, uh, the operator's hands are removed away from the point of operation in addition to there being a shield protecting the operator from, say, flying uh, materials that may occur. So uh, one example of how you might approach uh, uh, guarding a, an item in a, in a maintenance shop. Now I can tell you in other locations of facilities, we see uh, uh, often see issues with uh, guards not being adequate, that is not fully protecting uh, uh, machine hazard or guards that have uh, defective, falling, missing pieces, uh, holes in them, what have you. And these are just a few examples uh, of what's uh, potentially possible there. But uh, ultimately, think back to that item number 62 uh, on your uh, frequent uh, health and safety compliance challenges list there, and does the guard meet that purpose? And if it doesn't, it's probably, it may not be uh, adequate. Next on our issues, next on our uh, list is uh, electrical safety issues. So here we have issues regarding just basic electrical safety, that is equipment being free from recognized hazards, uh, guarding of live parts here, temporary power and lighting, uh, covers on junction boxes, the use of flexible cords, and training for qualified persons. So with regards to uh, one of those items, that is uh, clearance around electrical equipment. And the, the basic requirement is that you must maintain three foot, three feet of clearance in front of electrical equipment. And as the voltage of the equipment increases, that clearance increases. And here you're looking at just a, a few uh, examples where electrical equipment, proper clearance is not being maintained around uh, electrical equipment here. And I'm sure, this, again, this is common sense issues, and you've probably seen issues similar to this in other facilities as well. Uh, do keep in mind that uh, qualified employees need training. Uh, and NFPA 70E uh, actually says that this training for qualified employees should occur at least every three years or if new hazards or procedures are introduced. And these employees must be trained and knowledgeable on uh, the operation of the specific equipment, be able to recognize hazards, be familiar with precautionary measures, PPE, insulating and shielding materials, tools, and test equipment. It's quite a lot there. Next on our list is industrial hygiene. Uh, specifically, we're talking about uh, noise exposures and exposures to uh, air contaminants. And I'll, I'll begin this topic on, with this question right here. Take the uh, air hazardous air contaminant of carbon monoxide. And I might ask you, which of these exposure limits here is the correct exposure limit for carbon monoxide? And actually, the answer is all of them. It depends on uh, which uh, standard-making organization that you're talking about. Uh, ACGI, it's the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, publishes exposure limits. OSHA has exposure limits. NIOSH does as well. And some states with state-based uh, OSHA programs also have their own exposure limits, including TOSHA, which is the Tennessee uh, uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So th this is one reason why uh, interpreting industrial hygiene data or, or developing uh, sampling strategies can be challenging because of the uh, large number of exposure limits that may come into play there. One best practice uh, for managing your occupational exposures to hazardous air contaminants would be performing a qualitative uh, exposure assessment, such as you see here. This is a, a simple qualitative exposure assessment where we divide the uh, workforce up into similar exposure groups, departments, areas, job tasks, how many employees are affected, what's the stressor, in this, case, this first case it's toluene, the quantity handled, what's the exposure duration, are there dermal exposures involved, what's the exposure limit, and the idea is that you uh, are able to prioritize what your high risk exposures are, or exposures that potentially need quantitative industrial hygiene sampling. Another uh, challenge associated with uh, industrial hygiene work is how many samples to collect. So I may ask you, what's the, the most common number of air samples used to make a judgment about a chemical exposure? 
And uh, actually, uh, surprisingly, the answer to that is most is probably going to be zero. Think about your workplaces. You have hundreds or thousands of different chemicals there. Yet how many, if you do industrial hygiene sampling, how many industrial hygiene samples do you collect? Uh, you don't collect typically collect samples for every single chemical there. You look at a task, you deem it to be uh, low risk or low exposure, so you, hence you don't collect samples. That's fine. There, there, uh, you can do that ultimately if you uh, are qualified to make those decisions and if you're confident that that exposure is not likely to approach an exposure limit. If you're not, quantitative exposure assessments do need to be performed there. Also, uh, keep this in mind. Uh, this comes from the NIOSH Manual of Analytical Methods. Let's say you have a, an employee group of 10 employees that are doing uh, the same task. According to, uh, to NIOSH, to, uh, to be sure at a 90% confidence level that one, that one of your samples, air samples that you collect of those 10 employees is at least uh, represents a high risk exposure, you would need to collect 10, or excuse me, nine samples out of that employee group of 10. That's quite a lot there. So we're gonna talk more about uh, industrial hygiene and exposure assessments in our session uh, next week. And I know a number of you have actually registered uh, for that session. I'll also, uh, lastly, I'll finish up on, I, on the industrial hygiene piece with engineering controls. So here we're looking at a snorkel exhaust there at the left at a drum mixing station. And we have a slot hood over a tank uh, at the right there. OSHA says that you should use engineering controls and administrative controls to control your exposures to uh, uh, hazardous air contaminants. If, you can't, if those controls aren't feasible or don't work well enough, then you use personal protective equipment to control those exposures. So I would uh, argue that actually assuring that your engineering controls are performing properly is just as important as, as performing a qualitative or quantitative uh, occupational uh, exposure assessment. You want to make sure that those engineering controls are working properly. So in the case, cases of these snorkel exhausts and these slot hoods, one, someone can actually measure the, uh, the velocity of air being pulled into these systems and compare it to standards and you get some sort of a sense, is that engineering control uh, working as it was designed to? The last item on our list is hazard communication here. So we've got issues here listed with uh, written HAZCOM programs, containers uh, being labeled, uh, safety data sheets, and training for those exposed to hazardous uh, chemicals. And this topic of hazard communication is consistently one of the most cited OSHA standards year after year after year. And I want to talk briefly about this uh, second item here, containers of hazardous chemicals and how they're labeled. The basic requirement in the OSHA standard is that hazardous chemical containers be labeled with at least the name of the substance and some description of the hazards. But what we often see when, we do, when we've done our audits are a combination of what you see in this slide right here. So at the drum at the left there, there's no label at all. At the drum at the, I mean at the glass bottle at the right, you can see that the label has faded over time and it's obviously uh, not legible and we're not sure what's in that particular container. In the photograph in the center there, you can see that they use the uh, HMIS, that is the health, flammability and reactivity, uh, uh, blue, red, yellow system as a means to explain the hazards associated with the chemical here. But this, that label is obviously quite old and I can't read it so we, really have no idea what the hazards are associated with that the chemical that's in that container there. All right, so uh, that wraps up the PowerPoint uh, component of our presentation today. I know we've got a number of uh, questions. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and we've got, we've got a few questions there. I'm going to ask uh, Bayless to come back on and uh, my colleague Bayless Kilgore and see if he can uh, ask the, what, what questions the audience may have. Okay, great job, Leo. Uh, had one comment that was well taken uh, when you had the photo of the grounding and bonding with uh, an alligator clamp. The, uh, the comment was that you really should be using uh, an opposing point clamp, kind of like a, I think they're typically called FM Global. 
they'll penetrate the paint and the rust, whereas alligator clamps are really don't have a lot of spring in it, and so they're not as effective of a of a clamp. So I, I agree with that comment. So agreed. And actually, there's a a, a standard on static electricity hazard. It's NFPA 77, and that standard it specifically says that clamps used for bonding and clamp and grounding need to be uh, of of significant strength enough to penetrate any paint residues uh, uh, or oils or what have you that may be on the surfaces of the uh, of those containers but that's a good point yeah that, that's a very it's a fairly common thing that we see when when we do uh, audits around flammables because the uh, the clamps just aren't sufficient or the little points even uh, worn down and so you know those should be replaced on a routine basis um, there was a, a question um, is a PPE certification the same in the marine standards, which uh, I personally don't do a lot of marine work, uh, but I looked um, at the standards, uh, uh, the maritime standards, and I didn't see a requirement for certification specifically listed in the maritime standards, although there are specific requirements for eye and face, respiratory, head, foot, and other protective measures such as clothing and personal flotation devices. But I didn't, I didn't see that same um, statement like, is, like the general industry standard in 1910, uh, 132 that says, you know, you had to have a certification of the hazard assessment, so. Okay, thank you. All right, and then there was another, um, question it said for PPE hazard assessments how do this how does this apply to facility basics we require hard hat safety glasses earplugs uh, so on and so forth for, for anyone on the operating floor um, and the hazards are recognized in the need for PPE it, but it's more generic how do you recommend we apply the risk assessment requirement for these generic uh, standards so I can uh, take that one also if you want sure go for it <laughs> So, uh, you know, each, the requirement is, um, you know, each requirement to wear PPE must be based on a PPE hazard assessment and uh, PPE requirements may include an entire area. I don't see a problem with that just because it's easier to police, so to speak, and, and uh, clearly communicate those requirements. But usually there's certain tasks that, that may require additional PPE and that should be done as part of a a job safety analysis, uh, uh, PPE assessment using the OSHA hierarchy of controls uh, to not only look at just PPE, but you know, can uh, if this hazard um, this can it be eliminated or you know substituted out? Are there feasible engineering or administrative controls? And then lastly, supplemented with additional PPE if needed. So, so if you do that as part of a risk assessment with severity and likelihood. Uh, if you come out with a, a high risk, then it's probably going to take something more than PPE. It's going to, uh, you really want some type of engineering control to engineer it out. So, so that's what I would, I would say. I mean, it's very common to require earplugs and safety glasses and, and those things are just kind of generic requirements. But when you get into those specific hands-on tasks that require that might, that has a higher risk, that's when you would use that risk assessment process to determine what is needed. And then uh, lastly is one for you, Leo. Uh, is there a requirement as to the size and volume of the fire extinguisher based on the square footage of a space? There is, actually. Uh, and we talked in, my, in the presentation, I talked about the 75 foot travel distance for a uh, extinguisher to a class A uh, hazard. There's also provisions in NFPA 10 that said that that address that based on the extinguishing capacity of an extinguisher, it that it it can serve only so many square footage of a uh, particular facility, and that is addressed in NFPA uh, a 10 a, as I mentioned, um, and if. Uh, the individual would like to reach out to me directly, I can uh, go into much more detail uh, about that. But the, the mo what most people focus on is that 75 foot travel distance, but they don't realize that there's an additional requirement based on your extinguishing capacity. Okay, uh, I had a couple more pop up. Uh, is the safety data sheet logbook for, for hazardous materials only? And can other safety data sheets be part of the book as well? 
Um, I don't see any reason why you, know, you can't have additional safety data sheets. Um, you know, they're they're only required if it if the product contains a hazardous uh, product according to how OSHA defines hazardous. But as you well know, you see many safety data sheets for common products that will state this product contains no hazardous materials. So uh, certainly no problem, in my opinion, with having additional safety data sheets uh, for products that don't have hazardous ingredients. Uh, if nothing else, it demonstrates that, that they don't. <laughs> so that would be my thoughts on that. Okay, good. Is that uh, uh, any more questions? One more, hi, about, uh, about healthy workplace and safety floor is admitted to stack, or I guess, is it okay to stack three or more bulk bags? And in this case, they are 2,200 pounds each. Uh, so there is a uh, provision in the, in the ocean material handling standard that says that uh, storage shall be orderly and, and safe, essentially. So if, uh, in that case, I would probably defer to the, uh, the manufacturers of the bags. And if the manufacturer says don't stack more than three high then, uh, or more than two high, then uh, potentially you're creating an unsafe uh, scenario there. But, but the, the, gen yeah, the general requirement, it's in the material handling standard that uh, storage uh, is done in a safe manner. You, would you have any other comment on that, Bayless? Or? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, if, if you stack uh, three high and, and you go out there and consistently day after day, they're just straight and they're not leaning at all. Uh, and it, in, in your opinion, as a safety professional, it looks like it's nice and safe, then, you know, it, it's, it's likely okay. But if you go out there and depending on who's stacking one day to the next or how the bags are, are filled, and they're leaning, and it's obviously obvious that it's not, uh, you know, straight up. And and especially if there's pedestrian walkways <laughs> or people um, nearby, then then absolutely I would not want them stacked three high. We are approaching the end uh, now, almost 12:30. So uh, we're going to end it here. Thank you all very much. I'm going to share my screen uh, one more time. Uh, and give you, give one last uh, plug for our EHS educational uh, webinar series. So uh, I, I believe most, if not all of you, have uh, received this flyer. Again, this was uh, number two of eight. We've got six more uh, coming up here uh, over the next six weeks. Uh, if you want, if you haven't registered for some of them, uh, we're still accepting uh, registrations. Uh, everybody, again, everybody that was uh, on today will receive a certificate from us emailed within the next week or so. And I'm going to send you an email uh, directly after this. I'm going to uh, uh, copy again the uh, frequent health and safety challenges tool that, uh, that, we prov that I provided earlier, just in case you didn't get that. I'll send that as well. And I'll also provide a link to a four question survey, monkey survey, very short, should take you less than one minute to do, and we would certainly appreciate your feedback on this uh, uh, session. And I hope that this was uh, helpful today, and at least there's a few nuggets of information that you can use and, and take back uh, to your site. So uh, on behalf of Bayless and InSafe, uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, and uh, hope you have a great day. See you next week. Bye.